Hello from New York City and Columbia Business School Executive Education. My name is Olivia Wiles, and I am pleased to be joined today with Chris Mayer and David Sherman. Um, before I introduce uh, David and Chris for the Value Investing in Real Estate webinar, I wanted to go over a few quick housekeeping items. A recording of today's discussion will be available after the webinar. If you would like to tweet about the webinar, please do using hashtag CBSExecEd. And most importantly, don't forget to submit those questions using the Q&A chat box, and we will get to as many as we can during the last 10 minutes during the Q&A portion of the webinar. So I am joined today with Chris Mayer, and he is the Paul Milstein Professor of Real Estate and a Professor of Finance at Columbia Business School. His research explores a variety of topics in real estate and financial markets, including housing cycles, mortgage markets, debt, securitization, and commercial real estate valuation. He is the CEO of Longbridge Financial and serves at a, as a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a director of the National Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association, and a member of the academic advisory boards for Standard & Poor's and the Housing Policy Center at the Urban Institute. Mayer has written a paper for the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission and testified six times before committees of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. David Sherman has more than 30 years of real estate finance and analytical experience. He is a senior advisor and chairman of the Investment Committee at Metropolitan and the founder of D. Sherman and Company Incorporated. Previously, David was managing director of Solomon Smith Barney's REIT research team. Sherman also held positions in real estate finance, investment banking, and strategic planning at Smith Barney, the Harlan Company, First Boston, and Payne Weber. For seven years, David was an adjunct professor of real estate finance and at Columbia Business School. Today, he co-directs the school's Paul Milstein Center of Real Estate together with Chris. So I will be joining Chris and David at the end for Q&A, but for now, I will pass it over to Chris. Great, thank you very much, Olivia. And David, it is really a pleasure to be here with you. Likewise, Chris. Um, you know, co-directors of the uh, Milstein Center, we have really a wonderful opportunity to sit and meet people in the industry, alums, and really get kind of a great view of where things are going in the real estate business today. And I love it. Excellent. So, um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about value investing and real estate. So, as probably many of you know, value investing is an approach that was pioneered at Columbia Business School. Um, Graham and Dodd Investing, Benjamin Graham, sort of eminent you know, investment thesis, Warren Buffett, of course, an alum of the business school. This is really a place where for you know, many decades, um, we've thought about, studied, and learned what goes on in value investing. And what we're here today to talk about is how to think about some of, how some of those themes apply in the real estate business. And in particular, looking at opportunities for investors to identify, research, and buy assets that are you know, priced well below their true market value. And as you'll talk about in a little bit, mm -hmm. David, at this point in the cycle, it's often pretty hard to find opportunities like that. So that's where we're headed today. Um, one of the things I think is, you know, particularly helpful when you think about real estate and value investing um, is there are lots of ways to think about the underlying value of real estate assets. When you think about value investing in the value investing program, there are a number of things that come up. There's the issue of diversification. There's how you think about economies of scale, first mover, and barriers to entry. So obviously diversification is a reason that many institutional investors think about real estate, but they're also going to be looking for opportunities. And you know, thinking about barriers to entry, I've heard, you know, Bruce Greenwald, a longtime colleague, say there are five um, so-called forces when you think about uh, competitive strategy, but there's really only one force, which is barriers to entry. And of course, real estate recognizing that land can't, you know, buildings can't be moved and land has, you know, the ultimate barrier to entry because you can only do one thing on it. Um, that is a natural way to think about investing in real estate. And then, of course, there are questions about knowing when to buy and how does growth create value. All of these things are really critical issues for the real estate industry. When you think about real estate assets, you know a lot about them. You can look at comparable assets. You can look at different markets, global markets, to try and understand and identify themes that play out over time in different places. 
you can look at trading history and you have a lot of information about rent, occupancy, cap rate, value per square foot. As somebody who advised a hedge fund for a long time, the ability to come up with an underlying fundamental value of the asset um, is something that, while not unique to real estate, is you know a real trademark of the asset. And the final thing which many um, value investors in real estate think a lot about is the topic of replacement cost. And the idea that, you know, when I come into a market and maybe able to buy something well below the replacement cost, what that tells you is you're not going to have people come in and build more of it until the price gets back up to replacement cost. And that again gives you some idea of thinking about and understanding fundamental value. Well, Chris, let me jump in and talk about the the points that you were making there, because when I think about when I think about value investing in real estate, there are two types of value relative value and either absolute or fundamental value. The first point on the page, the value of an asset relative to the valuation of other assets in the same market at the same time, that's relative value. Some investors care a lot about relative value. If you're a REIT manager, you generally benchmark against either the REIT index or the S&P 500. You want to outperform that index. That's a relative valuation metric. Uh, if you're a, a private equity real estate manager and you don't care that much about your returns to investors, but you care a lot about raising the next fund, you might look to basically just outperform your peer group. The next two points, value relative to long-term norms in the market, and as Chris mentioned, replacement cost as a benchmark for value, those lead you to more of a fundamental long-term concept of value. And investors that are looking to do one of two things really need to focus on that. Either investors that are looking to build wealth over time, because by buying below long-term fundamental value, you have great downside protection, and you tend to be able to build wealth over time. Second thing is, if you're a private equity real estate investor and you're trying to outperform your own preferred returns so you as the manager can share in the profits, best way to do that is to really focus on the long-term inherent value and buy below that. Great, I mean, these are incredibly important things to think about as an investor is what are you trying to accomplish and over what time period. So a few basic themes that we think are important for people who are looking at investing in real estate. The first is people often think about real estate as a trading asset, which unfortunately misses what you really get when you buy a building, which is you're getting a long-lived cash-flowing asset. Buildings can last 30 to 50 years or more, and even as the building starts to get older, you have the ability to replace it, and the land or location is yours forever. And that really is a fundamental difference in the stock market where somebody, you know, your technology, your ideas can disappear, you know, the next day somebody can invent a new thing, but you know, New York City is still New York City and land sitting in New York City or London or Hong Kong or, you know, many other markets around the world, cities tend to be very durable and location in cities um, and the ability to do something with it is really valuable. The second is supply and demand. Different markets have a different ability to be built and rebuilt. And, you know, as a developer, probably one of the most painful things is putting up this really interesting and great building, um, followed a few years later by two others going up in plots not too far away, or in the case of, you know, housing in Phoenix, to see just tracks and tracks of houses get built. So understanding the potential for other people to enter the market, and this is the barriers to entry concept, in um, value investing, understanding how markets differ really, and property types differ is really important. Obviously interest rates and inflation matter, but they matter more for real estate than other assets in the sense that what you have is a long-lived cash flowing asset. So you're discounting those, those cash flows from a very long time period at a relatively low discount rate compared to other kinds of corporate assets because of the long-lived nature and the relative reliability of some of those cash flows. And losing sight of that is something that investors do at their peril. And the last, of course, is leverage, which is you know, the ability to turn a rough investment and survive a cycle. If you have too much leverage, it's a bad thing. On the other hand, if you put leverage on at the right moment, leverage can be your best friend. 
And so understanding what the trade-offs are really important. I have to make a comment about that one. Because <laughs> looking at actual industry practice, Chris is 100% right about leverage on the upside and the downside. But many institutional investors do this absolutely backwards. So what happened in 2006, 7, and 8? Investors levered up to try to take falling fundamental asset level returns and leverage them to the, the return they were looking for. That meant in the downturn, those equities were much more volatile and the downside was greater. So what did institutions do? In 2009, they delevered to zero, many of them, at exactly the time you should be levering up because assets were at their cyclical trough. And what we're seeing again now in 2019 is there are investors who are again buying assets where the asset level return is relatively low, but they're increasing leverage to try to increase the equity returns at the absolute wrong time. If you take away nothing from this conference call other than this, this is not a time to over lever. Um, well, to your point, um, <laughs> let's look and you know see. One of the things we talked about real estate and cash flow. This is from a uh, this is from um, NACREF, which is probably the leading index in the United States. And what we've done is we've disentangled returns into cash flow and depreciation. So cash flow is what you get on an unlevered basis. This is just what the buildings and the assets produce. Appreciation is the change in the price. And what you can see is almost all of the volatility in real estate comes from appreciation, not cash flow. Um, if you just owned an unlevered portfolio of real estate, in 2008 and 2009, you would have seen a little bit of a decline, depending on the property type. Um, apartment rents actually kept going up because all these people were losing their homes. But you know, in retail and hotels, there certainly were declines in cash flow. But the overall fundamental returns were pretty good if you just held real estate on an unlevered basis. If you marked it to market, that's the red line, and that's where appreciation or lack thereof really plays into the market. And it helps you understand that you can look at some of the other fundamentals, but when you come in and when you come out is a really critical driver of the returns to investing in real estate. And in fact, if you want to look at how a fund is done, looking at the name on the door will help you, but looking at the vintage of the fund, that is when did they get in and when did they get out, probably matters more than the name of the manager on the door, although of course the best managers know how to understand these things and play into them. Um, let me just give you one quick example and then David's gonna talk about um, how we think about investing in the market today. Um, 111 8th Avenue, um, this was a property in 1998 to Connick Partners purchased for 387 million. It's basically a, uh, a rectangular block, enormous building. Um, the neighborhood deteriorated. The meatpacking district wasn't then what it is now. Um, huge floor plates. Office buildings were out of favor. People started thinking about, you know, what matters was your web address, not your physical address. That's exactly the time a value investor looks and says, now is the time for me to go in and try and find something that is out of favor, but where long-term fundamentals make sense. And the great thing was, in 2010, um, Taconic Partners, who, you know, for those of you who are Columbia Business School alums, is co-run by Paul Pariser, who is an alum of the business school. In 2010, they sold that property for $1.9 billion. And if we were in class, I would take hands of who bought it, but the property was purchased by Google. And it turns out it's a really wonderful location. It's you know place in Manhattan where you have the uh, high-speed internet lines coming into uh, the city. But fundamentally, what they bought was relatively inexpensive real estate, far below the cost of replacing it. At a time, it was out of favor. And that's the kind of thing that value investors look for and the kinds of opportunities that you can do if you have a long enough time horizon and you try and follow the sort of basic tenets of value investing and you can be patient, which gets to David's point on timing. And today that building would cost $2 billion to build plus the value of the land. So even the last purchaser were below replacement cost. So now let's shift a little bit and, and shift from the fundamentals of how to value invest to what's going on in the market today. And I would characterize today as late in the economic cycle. So we call this late cycle investing. First thing to look at is what are the characteristics of late cycle investing? Number one, the economy is slowing down, but job growth is still positive. 
property fundamentals are peaking but also not falling. And valuations and multiples are relatively high, in fact, near a cyclical peak. So that growth is not negative, but it's the rate of growth is slowing down dramatically and valuations are high. So we put on this valuations high, high expected growth, because if you're looking at the, the fundamental mathematics at high valuations, you'd expect high growth. We're at the absolute opposite today, high valuations and lower growth. So what does this mean from an investor's perspective? First, it's hard to call the downturn. Markets like this can continue to extend for a while at this current level or even eke up a little bit from here. Second, if you're investing in a private real estate investment, your time frame to hold that asset is probably three to five years or longer. It's pretty likely that there's going to be a correction or a recession during your holding period, and you have to take that into account when you're buying the asset. And then when you look at the projections, the base case projection of cash flows and valuation on a new asset, today there's more downside scenarios than there are upside scenarios. More things can go wrong than right from this level. So let's back up a little bit. We know that or we believe that there's going to be a correction during the holding period, but we have to have a, a point of view on whether it's going to be a short, mild correction or a long, deep correction. And that's driven in part by the economy and in part by real estate fundamentals. Um, Chris, when you're thinking about the economy today, are you thinking that we might have a mild recession or does it feel like we're going to have a deep downturn? So, David, you know I'm an economist, so on one hand, on the other <laughs> hand. Um, this is why know, I asked. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I think, that's, I think that's a really hard question to ask. But I think the best evidence we have today suggests that at a minimum, growth going forward is going to be slower than it has been historically, given the best data we have. Part of that shows up in you know low and in some cases negative interest rates. And I think the challenge for people is to try and understand where that growth is. I don't know the answer to the question, but certainly by historical levels, we don't have some of the imbalances in credit markets that have in the past led to really significant, severe downturns. And those are the kind of things one looks for to be particularly concerned about, about are we going to see a crash? It's nothing like where we were in 2007, 2008, or in really you know, previous very sharp downturns. Great, Let, let's apply that same thinking to the real estate market, not the broader economy. What causes the property market to go into either a deep downturn or a shallow downturn. Uh, one is the change in economic activity. As economic activity goes down, demand from corporations goes down. Two is the level of oversupply, and I would characterize today's oversupply in most U.S. markets as relatively mild. And three is, is there too much financial leverage in the system? Are we looking at a 2007 scenario where bad balance sheets exacerbate the downturn and the correction. And I think there again, balance sheets are leveraged, but not anything like what we saw in 2007. Put that together with Chris's comments, I would expect there to be a correction for sure, but not a repeat of 2009, 10, 11. So when we think about risk factors, what risk factors do we have today? Risk factors to fundamentals in real estate, first recession, relatively likely, Two, oversupply, we said moderate. Changing demand patterns, this is a really interesting one. It, and, and it's different than it's been in prior cycles. Give, give an example of New York City office. In prior cycles, the center of New York City office demand was Park Avenue in the Plaza District. When the economy got better, those buildings filled up first and they had the best rental performance. This past cycle, that sector, that neighborhood has been quite weak. And the strength in the office market in New York has been Chelsea, Lower Broadway, Long Island City, places where young, hungry tech companies like Google, not so young, but <laughs> places where those companies want to locate. So that leads to risk if you happen to own a building on Park Avenue, but also great opportunity if you can get ahead of those trends. What are some of the other risks to valuation? Rising interest rates, relatively low. Chris talked about why. Number two, widening risk spreads. I think the risk there is relatively high. That is, how much does the yield over the risk-free rate need to be for an investor to buy an asset? Part of that is just the normal uncertainty during a correction. 
Part is the geopolitical risk that I would characterize today is as high as I've seen it in my 35-year career. Denominator effect is a risk as well. What that means is when institutions have an allocation to real estate, let's say a 7% allocation, let's say they're at that allocation today. When the stock market goes down, their denominator goes down, the size of their portfolio. Real estate isn't remarked every day. That 7% ekes up to 8 or 9 or 10, depending how much the market drops. They now look over allocated to real estate. At a minimum, what they do is to stop buying new properties. And sometimes what they do is they actually try to sell them. That creates outward demand in cash flow. Basically, there's less demand for new property than there was at the top of the market. We talked about leverage. OK, so what do you do? We're getting near the end of our presentation. So in this type of market, the average property may have more downside than upside, but there's certainly still ways to make money. Let's start with focusing on non-cyclical demographic drivers, assets that don't have demand that's tied directly to the, the economic cycle. Senior housing, medical office would be two examples. Second thing, assets that are less capital intensive. Uh, apartments and industrial being the most uh, uh, obvious and the ones that have performed best before. Now these assets will go down in a recession in terms of their valuation, but they don't require a lot of capital. So carrying through the recession is relatively inexpensive and they tend to recover relatively quickly when the economy recovers. So it's a way to preserve downside and preserve value. Third point, demand from industries that have secular growth. I'll give you an example. In Los Angeles today, the demand for creative office is extremely strong. It has nothing to do with GDP growth in the United States. It has to do with the fact that the tech companies have gotten into the media business and they all want fresh content. And the content requires two things. It requires a studio to actually create the content, but it requires office space for all the people that support that, that process. And those properties in LA are doing extremely well. Uh, and then lastly, there are properties that are just fundamentally not valued properly. We recently purchased a shopping center in the north of England, and you might say, why would we want to buy a shopping center with the problems in retail and Brexit? The answer was, the, it was a convenience center with a supermarket and other tenants that would likely continue to sell in a recession. Number two, we got a 100 basis point better yield than the long-term norm for that type of asset, and other assets were actually trading at much tighter yields than the long-term norm, so a great yield benefit. And number three, most of the cash flow came from a long-term lease to a high credit supermarket. And the first thing we did is we carved that off, sold the supermarket at a very tight yield, and we're left with double-digit cash flow return on convenience retail. So the asset was just mispriced. So thank you, David. I think we're on to questions. Olivia's uh, here. I mean, this is a subject I think we could wax on. We could go forever. For, we could go we a could very, go uh, okay. we could go forever Thank on you, this. Chris, for stopping me. <laughs> well, thank right. you both so much. I'm very happy to be back. Um, I have a ton of great questions coming in. So we'll start with um, this one here. Mirish wants to know, to your earlier point, are you both seeing an uptick in leverage used by investors in the RE market right now? Absolutely. Not every investor. The, the longer term thoughtful investors are deleveraging today in anticipation for equity values dropping. But anybody who's trying to hit an arbitrary benchmark of 12% or 15%, many of them are leveraging up. Right. And you know, when you think about value investing, one of the dangers is having outside things that come in, outside constraints to come in and tell you, this is what I have to earn, as opposed to this is what I can earn. And that difference is really important because the market tells you what the opportunities are. And part of being a value investor in real estate is understanding how to invest over time, not just deploying a bunch of cash at once because you need to. For sure. Great. Another question from Francisco uh, related to replacement cost. Is it always a good idea to buy properties below replacement cost? What if the negative carry of holding the property is extremely high? And how do you know what specific neighborhood will face an up market, for instance, Chelsea? So I think, you know, look, buying something below replacement cost is in no sense a guarantee that it's going to do well. 
I think properties in Des Moines, Iowa have been probably trading below replacement costs <laughs> for many decades and buying them in 1925 when agriculture was shrinking and the set of the economy was not going to be a winning strategy. You have to kind of think about longer term patterns. There are cities which have been durable and where growth has transitioned. So you'd probably be you know, surprised to discover that if you look at San Francisco property prices, the appreciation before 1980 was as strong or stronger than it was after that. And that's partly driven by the fact that San Francisco over time has evolved the kind of industries it has. The same thing is in Boston. New York, financial services used to be 30% or more of what the city was about. Now it's less than 10% of the um, employment. And so over time, great cities and you know are places where the economy changes in terms of what's driving it, but there's long-term patterns that matter. And in terms of neighborhoods, it's hard, but you have to be careful and recognize that neighborhoods evolve and change, and what goes in goes out but comes back in again, and that's the place where it's patient. I mean, look, there are no simple rules. There's no things, if I do this and this, I'm going to make a bunch of money and, you know, all's going to be good in the world. But those are some of the kinds of things that you want to think about in terms of investing, you know, in different locations. And actually, what you're talking about goes back to your early comment of barriers to entry. What New York, San Francisco, London, Hong Kong have is limited supply, extremely tight zoning, and the kind of long-term demand drivers you're talking about. So if you buy below replacement cost, in a market that's fundamentally growing, what happens is you get real appreciation in land values, and that's what drives everything. Yeah, people in Europe who were buying single family homes in places like Spain and Ireland after the markets collapsed, in the long term, the people in those countries are gonna need places to live. Even if there was some shrinkage in population, it's not like Spain's gonna depopulate all of a sudden and people are gonna disappear. And so the opportunity to buy houses well below what it costs to build them and to be able to hold them over time is the kind of investment that you look at and say, you know what, there may be some carrying costs along the way, but as David said, the time horizon matters. And you, you know, if you're gonna be a value investor, you have to be patient, and you have to recognize that the cash flow doesn't all at once deliver, but it also is about leverage. The more that's you lever. The that's the key. Yeah. That everything we're talking about requires you to have the ability to live long enough for the long-term trends to drive the returns in your asset. If you're over leveraged and in 2009, the bank takes your asset away, doesn't matter how cheap you bought it. So always maintaining a reasonable leverage on your asset. Absolutely, I think we have time for one more question. So I'll go with um, from Cliff. How, what, how do you think about office comps when marginal demand is contaminated by tech? For example, what happens if WeWork <laughs> disappears? Um. We work could disappear, but we work's tenants won't. So you have to think about where the underlying demand is. I mean, look, we work is a fascinating topic, and we could go on a very long not time. Not the next unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. and we're not going to get there on the timing side of that. But you know, the the underlying demand is driven by tenants. We work as an intermediary between the owners of space and the users of space whether they're the right intermediary, whether they create enough value for the long term to justify the valuation are great questions for investors to ask. And there's a lot of competition coming into the market by, you know, minute, much of it funded by owners of office properties that don't want WeWork to, you know, skim a bunch of the profits between them and their, um, you know, their uh, tenants. It's a good question, but it's not, I don't but, think but that's going to be driving WeWork. it. But it's that's not right. a, this is really about where the demand for office space is. Which neighborhood do, do uh, tenants want 200 feet per person or 100 feet per person? Tremendous change going on in the office market. And that definitely is something you have to keep your eyes on. Yes. And their ability to commit to a lease, short term mm -hmm. or long term. Those are all the kinds of questions you think about. But think about the underlying demand, as David said, not the... You know, not whether we not work is intermediary, intermediating it. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much, Chris and David, for joining us this morning. And thank everyone tuning in for joining us for the Value Investing in Real Estate webinar. As a reminder, this recording will be sent to you. But have a great weekend. And thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Olivia, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for us. having us, David. Great talking this with you. <laughs> thank you.